how we share the gospel has changed quite a bit since I was a college student and witnessing on the quad at UC Davis. And we used evangelism explosion. I don't know if you're familiar. Uh, there's also the four spiritual laws. Some of you are familiar with that. And uh, as a way to share the gospel, uh, God loves us. We are sinners. Uh, Jesus died for us uh, to take away our sins. And we receive Christ, uh, the four, four laws. And then there's also uh, ABC, uh, Billy Graham taught us that one. That's uh, admit, believe, confess. Um, and these are all methods of sharing the gospel. But sharing the gospel in all of these ways assumed certain things that people knew. It assumed that people had an understanding of God that we all shared as a general consensus understanding. People generally understood that God is a supreme being or he's a deity, that he's maybe watching from a distance. There's even a song about that. There's that notion of God that people basically had. So you could start with God is holy and then we are sinners and so forth. Or you could start with God is love and God loved us and sent Jesus. So you could start there, but today it's different. We can't assume that anymore because if you ask 100 people in San Francisco, tell me about God, you're gonna get 100 different ideas about who God is. God is the universe. God is the goddess within, right? You just have to go up to the street you know, to see that church for that one. Or, or, you know, God actually doesn't exist. There is no God. There's more, more of that. So there's all kinds of starting places that people have that don't assume that God is the God who is the God we've known in our past. And so in this context, when you don't have that starting point with God, then where do you start in sharing the gospel? Where do we start? Well, you start with God. <laughs> you have to start by actually reintroducing God again to assume that people don't have an understanding of God and just start that way. In this text, I don't know if you noticed, but there was a question that got repeated three times, three times in this text. And the question was this, is it because there is no God in Israel? That was the question that God gave to Elijah and then the, soul, the captain gave, uh, the messengers gave back to Ahaziah, and then Elijah spoke to Ahaziah. Is it because there is no God in Israel? And we could start with that same starting point. Is there no God in San Francisco? Is there no God in San Francisco? So, so far in this series of the life of Elijah, we've met some really interesting people, complex people. And we are about to meet the son of Ahab and Jezebel. His name is Ahaziah. And this guy, he's an interesting, complex guy as well. So we actually start to learn about him at the end of 1 Kings. So if you turn to the left and look at the end of 1 Kings chapter 22, starting with verse 51, just keep in mind, verse, 1 Kings and 2 Kings is really one book. It's just that they divided it here, probably because the guy who was writing 1 Kings ran out of parchment. And he just ended it here and picked up a new scroll and started 2 Kings. So that's where, why we have this division. But just pretend there's no division. Just pretend there's no division. So at the end of chapter 22, verse 51, Ahaziah, son of Ahab, became king of Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years, not a long time. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord because he followed the ways of his father and mother and of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. He served and worshiped Baal and aroused the anger of the Lord the God of Israel, just as his father had done. So that's an important place to bridge into chapter one of second Kings, because here we see that God has been provoked by Ahaziah 
Because Ahaziah has willfully followed the way of his father and rebelled against God, committed spiritual adultery against God by serving other idols, here God is incited, God is provoked, and God acts in a way to wake up Ahaziah, to wake him up to the reality of who God is. All right, so this is where we find our first entry point into sharing the gospel even today. It is introducing God, introducing God. So God reveals himself to Ahaziah in four circumstances. And these four circumstances is also how God may introduce himself today. The first one is political, political. So what we learn is in this, in this text that he had wrecked, God wrecked a fleet of ships that he was constructing. And we see that if we go a little bit further up in 1 Kings twenty two forty eight. It says, now Jehoshaphat built a fleet of trading ships to go to Ophir for gold, but they never set sail. They were wrecked at Ezion Geber. And at that time, Ahaziah, son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, let my men sail with yours. But Jehoshaphat refused. So what's going on here? They were trying to build a big fleet of ship, and they did. And if you think about how much money and time and investment that would take to build a whole fleet of ships just to have it wrecked, uh, that's disappointing, right? And Ahaziah wanted to combine with Jehoshaphat in running this fleet of ships. Now, why did it get wrecked? Was it there some freak storm, whatever? Well, we actually learn about this. You can just listen to this. The parallel passage in 2 Chronicles 20, verses 35 to 37, says this. Later, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, made an alliance with Ahaziah, king of Israel, whose ways were wicked. He agreed with him to construct a fleet of trading ships. And after these were built at Ezion Geber, Eliezer, son of Dodavahu of Marasha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you've made an alliance with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. The ships were wrecked and were not able to set sail to trade. So how did they get wrecked? The Lord wrecked them. Why did the Lord wreck them? Because Jehoshaphat and Ahaziah had this unholy alliance. And they were trying to create an alliance of power to gain trade without God. Without God. So, politically, what are we seeing? God is actually moving politically to awaken Ahaziah. Right? He's awakening him to this. The second thing that we find politically is back in our text. So if you go back to 2 Kings chapter 1, it says in the very first verse, after Ahab's death, Moab rebelled against Israel. That's another political problem. Now what happened here? It was David that actually had subdued Moab way back in the day. And Moab would then pay tribute every year to Israel after that point, and give 100,000 lambs and wool of 100,000 rams every year. This was part of their service to Israel until now, until Ahab died. And so Moab, probably seeing an opening, a weakness, with the death of Ahab, is saying, okay, now's our chance. We're going to rebel. We're done. So we have these two examples, two political examples of upheaval. Now, God is involved in both of these examples. And when God produces this kind of upheaval, it's meant to get his attention. It's meant to get Ahaziah to say, wake up. God is the God who makes Israel Israel, not your ships. And it's, and it's God who keeps you secure, your border secure there. Moab is coming at you because you're not trusting in God who keeps you secure. So when this happens, he's supposed to say, God is sovereign. God is in control of the nations. But he didn't. There's a second circumstance. So that's political. The second one is physical. We see in chapter 1, verse 2, as I fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria. So he's in his palace. He's walking around. And he's fallen through the roof there. 
He hurts himself. He injures himself. And he's sick for a long time. And what do we always get? Do you ever, you know this, when you're sick, you get physically injured, oftentimes. It's a time that God gets your attention, isn't it? Right? It's like, hey, I'm the one who sustains you. I'm the one who heals you. I'm the one who watches over your life. I keep you, right? C.S. Lewis said, pain is God's megaphone, right? God speaks to us through pain, physical pain. And that's what he was supposed to get. He was supposed to say, oh, God, here I am on my bed. I'm on my back. I can't do anything. Have mercy on me. God, help me. God is trying to wake him up through physical pain. Thirdly, the third way God's trying to wake him up is through person is personally. So politically, physically, personally. And this is where Elijah ends up actually confronting him personally. And this is in verse 16, where he says, He, Elijah, told the king, This is what the Lord says. Is it because there's no God in Israel for you to consult? That you've sent messengers to consult Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron? Because you've done this, you'll never leave the bed you're lying on. You'll certainly die. So it's through this personal encounter that God is trying to wake him up. Wake him up to the reality that God is a personal being. A God who is just and judges sin. But also gives mercy for those who repent. This is a personal circumstance. God is saying, wake up, Ahaziah. And then the... The fourth one, the fourth one is through precedence. When you hear the story of the fire that's falling down on the captain in the 50, and then the next captain in the 50, and then there's the third one that's about to get fire, right? Does that remind you of anything? Right? Fire falling down, right? It was chapter 18. We saw fire come down, consume the sacrifice on the altar in the big showdown between Baal and God in the big fire contest, right? That was the last time we saw fire. That happened to Ahaziah's father. He was on that mountain. It could have been Ahaziah was on that mountain too. So he probably saw the fire of God come down and consume so the fire of God coming down to consume his own soldiers should have reminded him. The precedence is there that God is God. God is the God who sends judgment. Now here's the difference between Carmel and this scene. It's really important. On Carmel, what did the fire consume? The sacrifice, the bull, the altar itself, the water itself, all of it was consumed by the fire. What should have been consumed on Mount Carmel are the people, the ones who had rebelled against God. Those are the ones who should have, but they didn't. It consumed the sacrifice. What does that say? That God is the God of covenants, and his covenant centers around the sacrifice. And the ultimate sacrifice is Jesus. But here... In this scene, this, the fire comes down and consumes the soldiers, meaning that judgment is getting closer. Judgment is getting closer. It's now consuming the people. And it's because God is just. But he's just in revealing that he's the judge of sin, but every time it consumed those soldiers, Ahaziah should have said, oh, if God is about to consume and judge sin, I now have this window of time to repent. I can repent and find and turn to God. And I don't know if you remember when we looked at Ahab the other day, we saw Ahab, he received a similar word. Remember when the word of the Lord came and said, Ahab, your time is done. Your, your time is done. What did Ahab respond with? There was no invitation to mercy there all there was with judge was judgment and ahab responded by putting on sackcloth and ashes and he walked around it's, it says in scripture so slowly and lowly meaning he humbled himself and what it was god's response then god said oh look at ahab he humbled himself he's repentant and he said to ahab i'm going to slow down the judgment i'm going to slow it down 
I'm not going to, I'm going to delay it. It's not going to come on you. It's going to come later. You see? Even though Ahab never heard any offer of mercy or kindness in that, he, all he heard was judgment, he still counted on the fact that perhaps God is a merciful God, and he repented. He turned. That's what Ahaziah should have done. When he heard the word of judgment that was coming, that said, you are not going to leave your bed. You are going to die in your bed. He should have done what his father did and repented to God. This is how mercy is found in judgment. Yeah, the judgment's going to come, but there's time to repent. That's mercy. That's what Ahaziah should have done. So what, what has God revealed about himself in these four circumstances? Politically, God is the God who is sovereign over the nations, right? Physically, God is the one who holds our lives together. Every molecule in our body is sustained and held together by God, and we are able to breathe by his mercies, right? What else? God has revealed himself. How? God has revealed himself personally. How many times has God brought people into our lives personally where we have tasted the goodness of God through people, his people, the love of God through his people. How many times has God, through precedent, reminded us of things he's done in the past? Oh yeah, God, you are a God of justice, but you are also a God of mercy. So there's time. There's time to repent. You see what, what God is doing for Isaiah? He's taking a, a, a man who should have known God, but had no notion of God. God was not in his landscape. God was not in his worldview at all. But what God is doing through circumstances, rebuilding that knowledge of God so that God is now unavoidable. At least he should have been. But why didn't Ahaziah respond? Why didn't he turn? Why, why didn't he? Well, we find out that there's another thing to address, and this is the second entry point. We introduce God, but we also, the second entry, uh, entry point here to sharing the gospel is identifying idols. The reason Ahaziah could not see God was because he was fixated on his idols. Fixated on his idols. And when you're so focused on the thing you worship that's not God, it's very hard to see God. It's very hard to see God. So that's why it's very important when we share the gospel to try to identify what are the idols, what are the other things we're worshiping along the way. And in verse 2 here, it says, Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice, and what does he do? What's his response? Go consult. Oh, go consult. That's a good start, right? Go consult. Yes, when I am injured and I need help, I need to go inquire, go consult Baal Zebub. Who? What? That's who he goes to consult. Not God, not the God of Israel, but this other God, this other God, but Baal Zebub. Actually, if you go to the New Testament, we hear that Baal Zebub in the, in the form of Baal Zebub, Beelzebub. Jesus was accused of being someone who followed Beelzebub. Right? So there's a relationship there who, who is a demonic spirit. And here, he's going to Baal Zebub. Baal Zebub. Where do you go to find comfort when you're hurting? Where do you go to find help when you're in crisis? That's, where you're, that's what you're worshiping. It's whatever you find your fundamental trust in to find significance, to find security, find stability in your life, that's what you worship. For Isaiah, it was Baal Zebub. Baal Zebub. But it's true today that we have our own idols. It's not maybe images made of stone, but we certainly have our share of it. Uh, yesterday, I was uh, at First Baptist Church, San Francisco. They had celebrated yesterday their 175th year Founded in 1849. Remember 1849, San Francisco history? Period of the gold rush, right? Everybody from everywhere was coming because there's gold and then there 
hills, right? So there, there they come, all these hedonists looking for a quick buck, looking for gold, looking for pleasure. And, and in the midst of that, you had some Baptist ministers, Presbyterian ministers who recognized, whoa, there's all this mass of people. We need to go to them and give the gospel to them. And so one of them was the founder of First Baptist Church. He came, and as he came, he looked around the city, and he reflected and wrote letters and said, I've never seen such immorality in my life. It's indescribable what I'm seeing. But one thing he said, and he was quoted yesterday, Pastor, uh, the Pastor Wheeler, he said, the hardest thing is to convince a man of eternity while he's staring at a piece of gold. The hardest thing to do is to convince a man of eternity while he's staring at a piece of gold. That's exactly what's happening with Ahaziah. He's so fixated on his gods, and his god is not just Baal Zebub, his god is also power. Power. Because he's the king. And so he wants to ensure that he's going to continue to be the king. And so he's got his gods, and while he's fixated on his gods, it's so hard for him to see eternity, to see the living God of Israel. And this is true for us. It's true for the people that are lost around us, the people we're trying to witness to. Sometimes they can't see God because they're so fixated on the God that they're worshiping and fundamentally trusting. What are some of those gods? I mean, you know, money would be a big one. Career, another one. Romance, love, beauty, looks, all of these things can be, a relationship can be your God. Your children can be your God. Making sure that your children are, are well educated and achieving and, the, and that they're doing well can be the thing that you so count on to make your own life feel like you're significant as a parent, right? Family can be a God. Religion can be a God. Ministry can be a God. Running a church can be my God, right? There's so many good things, and this is the thing. Idols usually are good things initially, right? Nothing wrong with any of the things I just mentioned. It's when they turn into the ultimate thing. That's what Tim Keller always says. It's when you take good things and make them the ultimate things. Like, this has to be my security. This has to be my fundamental trust. You know, I've met with married couples who find themselves, and usually when they're in trouble, they call pastor when it's like way down the road. It's like way far gone. It's almost like too late. And then they suddenly realize, maybe I should have, we should have talked to our pastor. And so by the time I get to them, there's so much sometimes bitterness and anger. And so I look at that, and I, I, my first instinct is, well, I got to help these two people find forgiveness, right? Help them forgive each other. Help them cover the multitude of sins. That's what love is, right? But here's what I found. When the husband or wife looks at the other spouse to be more than just their spouse, but to almost fill the role that only God can fill, like my spouse needs to love me in such a way that I know that I am significant or that I have meaning or that I have purpose or that I have security or I have stability or I have all of these things that only God can fulfill, then I can tell that person all day long to forgive each other, all day long to ask for forgiveness, to humble themselves, to seek understanding. I could do that all day long, but unless they admit that they are making their spouse their idol, they're not going to get to that place. They're not going to get to that place of being able to forgive each other. Because if you still believe that your spouse has to fulfill what only God can fulfill, how can I, full, how can I forgive that person? How can I forgive them for not being God? Right? So this is what this is why idolatry is the place to go. How can they even know God? How can they actually ask God to forgive them if they are holding on to other idols that they're seeking ultimate 
satisfaction from, right? So what are the idols? That's, a, that's an important thing to try to suss out uh, when you're talking with somebody who's, who's still not believing in Jesus. Ahaziah could not forsake his idols. He couldn't give them up. And that's why. That's why. So what happens to Ahaziah? Elijah eventually comes, right? That one last captain of, of that 50 men says, I know what happened to the last two guys. Elijah, please, please, not me. And what does he say? Value me. Respect my life. It's a plea for mercy, man of God. Respect my life. And Elijah hears from God and says, you can trust him. He's, you don't have to worry about this, this guy. So Elijah goes with the captain, goes and meets with Ahaziah. And that's when he gives the same exact word that, that Ahaziah had heard from the messenger before. It's the same exact thing. Because Elijah is a really good prophet. All he does is deliver God's word. That's all he does. And that's what he does. And so he gives that word again. He says, this is what the Lord says. Verse 16, is there no God in Israel for you to consult that you've sent messengers to consult Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Because you've done this, you will never leave the bed you're lying on. You will certainly die. Again, it's a word of judgment, but there's a an invitation to that man, Ahaziah, to turn, to plead for mercy. This is the time. But he doesn't. And so what's next? There's nothing next. Verse 17, so he died. So he died. According to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Is that what God wanted? Did God want Ahaziah to die? Does God ever want anyone to just die? No. God desires that none should perish, right? But that all should come to eternal life. Oh, it's very sad. This is not what God wanted for Ahaziah, but Ahaziah would not respond. He would not respond. So how does the gospel then shape us? Here's, here's, here's an important piece. I want to close with this. Think about Elijah. Where have we seen Elijah? We've seen Elijah from the beginning called, and he went over to Ahab, and he gave him the word of the Lord, and, and then God sent him to the brook, and then God sent him to Zarephath, and God sent him to the widow, and God sent him everywhere, and then he sent him to Mount Carmel, and God spoke through him powerfully, and the fire came, and then all the people of Israel said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God, slaughtered the prophets of Baal, judgment came, and then he chases Ahab off, to Jezreel, and before he gets to Jezreel, he hears from Jezebel, I'm coming after you. Elijah, I'm coming after you. And remember Elijah in chapter 19? He's, he's heartbroken. He's despairing. He said, wait a minute. My whole life's work, my whole ministry was about God revealing himself so that all of Israel would say, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And all of our hearts would turn back to him, including Ahab and Jezebel. But Ahab and Jezebel didn't follow through. Instead, they were continued in their rebellion, started chasing Elijah. And Elijah was like, this is not the way it's supposed to happen. God, this is not how the story's supposed to go. I'm done. He turned in his prophet keys. He said, nope, I'm, I'm done. I, you know, end my life. There's no point. My whole life's a failure, right? Remember that? What does God do? God says, come to this cave right here on Sinai. He shows up in the earthquake, shows up, right? Shows up in the wind, all of that. He doesn't show up in all of those ways. He says, I'm going to whisper to you. God revealed himself to Elijah just the way that Elijah needed to see God. See, even Elijah had lost God. Even Elijah had lost that. He had put his identity in the outcomes of his ministry. He had put himself and said, no, it's got to work out this way. And because he did that, his more fundamental trust was in trusting the outcomes of ministry rather than trusting the God who he worships. And so what does God do? He reveals himself again 
as the God who he's to worship. God who speaks in a still small voice. That's what he still does today. He's, and he did that for Elijah. And once Elijah heard that still small voice, he experienced grace. He experienced a new commissioning. He experienced a new mission in life where he wasn't going to go it alone. Now he had a school of prophets that we're going to be working with, and he had a new way of going. And so what do we see here? You know what we don't see? We don't see Elijah saying to Isaiah, oh, you're just like your father, right? We don't see that. We don't hear that. Oh, you knucklehead, you're doing exactly what your dad did, except you're even worse. We don't see that from Elijah. You know why? Because Elijah knows that the work of the ministry of God is not depending on the outcomes, it's just depending on God. It's about being faithful to God, not depending on certain outcomes to happen in ministry and in life. That's where he found his hope. He found his hope in God again. And so the outcomes can be what they are, whatever they are. But Elijah is not going to be despairing now. He's just going to be faithful. And he's faithful to deliver that word to Ahaziah. Ahaziah, just like his father, doesn't repent. But Elijah stays in that place of grace. And this is the last job that God had for Elijah. But I love the fact that Elijah is now responding in a way that is graceful. It's gracious. It's gracious because He's trusting in God. He's being faithful to God. That's where he's finding his satisfaction. So even, even while he's looking at an Ahaziah who's finding himself without any knowledge of God and who is worshiping the idols of his life, Elijah could reflect back and say, you know what? I too had lost the voice of God in my life. But God in his grace turned me around, recommissioned me, and, and reminded me that I just need to be faithful to him. And I don't need to put my idolatry in my ministry. I just need to be faithful to him. You see? So this is what the gospel needs to do in our lives. The gospel needs to reshape us so that we, as people who offer this gospel, do not offer it out of self-righteousness. We don't off offer it to try to you know, get some more marks on our tally sheet of conversions. It's not about any of that. It's only about being faithful to God because God in his grace was faithful to me, faithful to forgive me, faithful to love me, and so we just go to dying people as a dying person, right? We're dying people going to dying people and saying, hey, we found the lifeboat. Come, come on in. Come on in. That becomes our posture when we let the gospel shape us. Because that is the gospel. We're saved by grace through faith. We share the gospel by grace through faith. Everything is by grace through faith, everything. So the gospel has to change us before we start offering that same good news to others. It has to first do that work in us. And a lot of us may still need that work to be done. Because a lot of us might think, no, God loves me because I go to church every Sunday, I read the Bible, I pray, I do work of ministry, and God loves me more because of those things. Nope, that's not the gospel. The gospel is only that we are saved by grace, only. That's it. Through what he's done for us, not what we do for him. It's only by grace. And when that grace has its work in our life, we're now free. Free from the burden of having to earn anything by sharing the gospel. We are free to share the gospel because it's the good news of grace that we can freely give just as we freely received it. Has that work happened in your life? Has the work of grace happened in your life that you offering the gospel is just what you do because you're grateful and because you've received grace? Or is evangelism just another notch on your righteousness belt that you're trying to earn God's love for you? That didn't work for Elijah. It didn't work for Elijah. It won't work for us. 
Elijah experienced God. Elijah experienced grace. Elijah lived in his identity as a beloved son of God. That was enough for him to share the gospel. Keep in mind where we are. I want to close with this. We're in Samaria, aren't we? Northern Kingdom, capital city of Northern Kingdom, Israel is Samaria. If we go to the New Testament, Jesus went through Samaria, didn't he? Remember the Samaritan woman at the well, right? That's where he, he led that woman to know Jesus. And that woman went back to Samaria. And everyone heard her testimony. And they too believed in Jesus as the Messiah because of her testimony. That's what God wants to do in Samaria. And then what happened is also in Luke 9. We find that the, the, they had gone through Samaria. And the Samaritans, once they learned that Jesus was going through Samaria, but he wanted to go to Jerusalem, they turned on him. The Samaritans turned on him. And, and the sons of thunder, James and John, were walking with Jesus, and they said, huh. They probably thought to themselves, I remember what Elijah did when he was in Samaria. He called fire down. Jesus, should we call fire down on these Samaritans? What does Jesus say? Yes, justice, judging sin, that's why I've come. No, he rebuked them, didn't he? He rebuked those disciples. Like, no, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. So what happens in Samaria? We learn later on in Acts that the gospel was believed in Samaria and the Holy Spirit came upon the Samaritan believers in Acts chapter 9. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? So while we see the justice of God coming down upon these soldiers, the fire of God and justice, we also see that the mercies of God is what he really wants to give. He wants to give mercy. He wants to give his Holy Spirit. He wants to bring the people of Samaria to a place where they can trust in Jesus and find life in, with God. That's the picture. So has the gospel shaped you in such a way that he has graced you in such a way that there is no notion of looking at anybody who's lost with any sense of self-righteousness or patronizing or condescension. There's none of that if grace has wrecked you. <laughs> right? Has grace wrecked you? Where you just... Just like the, the captain said, man of God, please have respect for me. Please have mercy on me. Man of God, have you come to Jesus and said the same? Son of God, have mercy on me. Wreck me with your grace and mercy. Because that's where we find life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can say to the question, is there a God in San Francisco? There is. There is. You are working in this city. You've been working in our past. You've been working in our lives personally. There's so many ways that you've been working. And so, God, we pray that as we are sharing the gospel with people, that you, Lord, you would help us show them how you're working. Show them, God. And that your Holy Spirit would open their eyes to see who you are, that you are the living God but that you're a God who satisfies us as no idol can. Lord, we pray that we, would help, that we would help others as you have helped us. Deep in our wonder of the gospel, that we're accepted through what you, Jesus, have done for us, so that we can sheerly, with wonder and joy, give it away. In Jesus, your name we pray. Amen.